Good morning, I'm Pastor Dan from Life Church. Today we're continuing in our message series, Jesus in Action. And in this series, we're learning more about Jesus from the Gospel of Mark. We're learning about the things that he did in the past, and he still does the same things today through his Spirit. Today we're going to learn how Jesus' actions can help each one of us in our daily lives. Now, has anybody here besides me wondered if things were out of control in our world these days? I simply don't remember a time when so many crazy things have been going on at the same time, and somehow they all are interrelated and seem to magnify one another. COVID has gone from something that was over in China to a pandemic that affects every aspect of our lives. Some say everything will be back to normal next year, and others that it will never go away. On top of this modern day plague, we've had hundreds of riots causing billions of dollars of damage across many major cities. Rather than a push for law and order, we've seen cities defund and hamstring their police forces, leading to a great escalation of crime in many places. There's extreme divisiveness between people over politics, religion, and race. And all of these external stresses are causing negative impacts on the lives of many people. It's affecting people's jobs, finances, relationships. Addictions and overdoses, suicides and divorces are increasing. Fear, stress, worry and anxiety are accelerating across the nation, especially as we head into the election on November 3rd. We are tempted to doubt that Jesus is still in control. We're tempted to be fearful. And if Jesus isn't in control, then we truly are in big trouble. But I have some good news for everyone listening. Our message today is entitled, All Authority. Authority means absolute power over something or someone. Let's learn about Jesus' authority. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 19, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. And so the good news is that Jesus has all authority over everything in heaven and on the earth. Nothing is outside his control. He is in charge. Well, you might ask, why then do we see all this trouble, this sin, this chaos, if Jesus is in control? And the answer is that you and I live in a war zone. We live in a battle between good and evil, between Jesus and Satan. That's going to continue and increase in intensity until Jesus returns. The good news is that the final outcome of the war has already been determined and Jesus wins. And as believers, we are on the winning side. And our reward and victory as overcomers will be to spend eternity with Jesus and the rest of the winning army. And in the season that we're in, God has a purpose and a plan. In this season, God is exposing evil and he's drawing people to himself. People are looking for answers to the fear and worry that they're experiencing. The kingdom of God is at hand, and it is breaking through the domain of darkness. I believe that many will turn to Jesus in this season and be saved out of the enemy's hands. And Jesus gave his army of believers our marching orders by his authority. No matter how bad things may look, no matter how chaotic things may be, we are to go and make disciples of Jesus. It is when things are bad, when there seems to be no hope, when everything seems out of control that people finally turn to Jesus. And so as believers, we don't need to worry or fear no matter what is going around us. Jesus has all authority. We must submit to and trust in Jesus' authority. Trust Jesus' authority over sin and sickness. Sin and sickness are two manifestations of the fallen world in which we live. We are responsible for our own sin, and each of us has sinned, the Bible says. Sickness may or may not be caused by sin, but is part of the human condition for all of us. But there is hope, for Jesus has authority over both sin and sickness. I'd like us to watch a short video clip from the movie Son of God on the healing of a paralytic by Jesus that we are going to be studying today. 
How shall we picture the kingdom of God? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. The smallest seed in the world. Yet, when planted, It grows up. Rabbi! He's paralyzed. Sins are forgiven, my son. Did you hear that? He has forgiven his sins. I thought only God could do that. It's not blasphemy. He knows. It is blasphemy. Is that your wish, my friend? Well, answer me. Tell me which is easier. To say his sins are forgiven. Or say he. Get up. And walk. Wait. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. Mark chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, And they came bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. And when they could not get near him, that's Jesus, because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And so Jesus was teaching, preaching God's word to a crowd of people gathered in a home. And the news of both Jesus' teaching and healing of the sick had continued to spread across the region. And so the house in which Jesus was teaching was completely filled. No one could get in. Now, four men had a paralyzed friend whom they were carrying to see Jesus in the hope that he could be healed. And when they came to the house where Jesus was, there was no way for them to enter because of the crowd. But rather than give up, they went up on a stairway onto the roof, dug a hole through the roof, and lowered their paralyzed friend down to Jesus. Close to Jesus is where miracles happen. Let me say that again. Close to Jesus is where miracles happen. And the same is true today. Now, what would Jesus do after these men destroyed the roof of the house where he was? Well, verse 5 says, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And so when Jesus looked at these five men, he saw their faith. He saw the faith in the four who had carried their friend to Jesus, and he saw faith in the paralytic. They believed that if they could get their friend close to Jesus, he would be healed. And yet, the first thing that Jesus said had, had nothing to do with healing. Jesus spoke to the paralytic and told him that his sins were forgiven. We know from God's word that unconfessed sin may be an impediment to healing. And so not only did Jesus see faith in the paralytic, I believe that he saw a repentant heart. And so Jesus pronounced that the paralytic was forgiven of his sins. The Jewish scribes did not like what Jesus said. They said in verse 7, why does this man speak 
like that. He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The scribes understood that no human being could forgive someone else's sins. And so for Jesus to pronounce forgiveness meant that he was claiming to be God, which he was. Jesus was also preparing the lame man, the paralytic, for the miracle of healing. And he said in verse 10, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Now, one cannot see the forgiveness of sins with the physical eye, and so anyone could pronounce forgiveness. But Jesus was going to show his authority to forgive sins by a healing miracle. And so he commanded the paralytic to rise, pick up his mat, and go home. And that's exactly what the lame man did. He was instantly healed and able to walk, even though he had not done so for many years. Everyone in the crowd was amazed at the authority of Jesus over both sin and sickness. So let's begin to think about how Jesus' authority over sin impacts our lives today. No matter what you've done, before becoming a believer or after becoming a believer, or if you're not a believer at all, Jesus can forgive you. All you need to do is to repent, confess your sin to him, and he will forgive you. Now, sometimes for believers, Satan will continue to bring a past sin to our minds to get us to doubt our forgiveness or even our salvation. And we must remember that Jesus has all authority to forgive our sins, no matter how great. And when they are forgiven, they are no longer counted against us. We are cleansed, the Bible tells us, from all unrighteousness. And so if you're battling guilt for a past sin, as you're watching the message, simply confess it to Jesus and accept his forgiveness. He will bring cleansing and peace into your heart and life. Now, the second way that Jesus' authority over sin affects us is, is when we see sin in others. Sometimes as believers, we may look at an unbeliever whose life is filled with sin and think that that person could never be saved. But nothing is further from the truth. Jesus can forgive any sin. He can save any person. And so we must look at every person as a potential son or daughter of God, praying that they'll repent and be born again. Now, Jesus also has authority over all sickness. Jesus is no longer physically with us, but he is with us by his spirit. And as believers, through faith and prayer, we can also minister healing to those who are sick, both believers and unbelievers. And so never doubt the power of Jesus to heal. Pray for the sick around you every chance that God gives you. The more that we pray and the more that our faith grows, the more healings we'll see. Healing shows the power of God today, just as it did with the healing of the paralytic. Healing opens closed hearts to the truth of the gospel. So let's grow in our trust of Jesus' authority over sin and sickness. Next, we must submit to Jesus' authority over tradition. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while well, the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. And so some people had come up to Jesus, ask him why his disciples did not fast like the Pharisees did. Now, the Pharisees had all kinds of traditions about fasting, many of which Jesus condemned in various teachings. Some fasted thinking that it drove off demons. Others fasted to have their sins forgiven. And yet others fasted simply to be seen as holy by other people. All of these traditions and practices had no value before God. Jesus referred to himself as the bridegroom in these verses and said there was no need to fast while he was here. But when he was gone, when he ascended to heaven, there would be a place for fasting. Not fasting to earn merit with God or to be seen by others, but a fasting in obedience to God's Spirit to draw closer to God and to hear his voice more clearly. Jesus continued in verse 22. He said, No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins 
and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins, but new wine is for fresh wineskins. So in this analogy of Jesus, the old wineskins referred to the Jewish traditions, which were going away. The new wine referred to the coming of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus didn't come to fix Judaism. He came to bring the new wine of the Holy Spirit to fill fresh wineskins, people's lives who had been radically born again. In God's kingdom, there is no place for tradition. Simply, tradition is simply going through the motions of some activity you think is for God. Everything in the kingdom that Jesus brought must come from the heart and be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Verse 23 says, One Sabbath he, that is Jesus, was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now the Pharisees took the Old Testament law, which said you should rest on the Sabbath and worship God rather than work, and they invented all types of traditions. They wrote books detailing what actions were work and therefore sin on the Sabbath. One of these was simply plucking a few heads of grain to eat. This was considered harvesting or working on the Sabbath and was breaking the law according to their religious traditions. Well, Jesus said to them in verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so Jesus answered them and said basically that their traditions were nonsense. The Sabbath was a day of rest. It was meant to benefit man rather than burden him down with endless regulations and traditions. Jesus made it clear that religious traditions had no place in the life of his followers. And so we must submit to Jesus' authority over tradition. Now, there are two types of religious tradition that ensnare people today. And Jesus condemns and takes authority over every type of religious tradition. The first type of religious tradition is some type of activity that seeks to please or reach God, but is not found, described, or instructed in the Bible. Obviously, all the habits and traditions of non-Christian religions, such as Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on, have absolutely no value in bringing anyone closer to God. Now, many so-called Christian churches follow various Christian traditions that have no basis in Scripture either. The Holy Spirit will not inhabit those types of old wineskins which lead people away from God rather than toward Him. One example is infant baptism. It's a practice that has absolutely no support in Scripture. Scripture exclusively teaches believers baptism, being water baptized after you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so the unbiblical religious tradition of infant baptism confuses many people about the nature of salvation. It causes people to miss the blessing of scriptural believers baptism by immersion. And so at Life Church and in the Assemblies of God, we, we seek to pattern everything that we do according to the teaching of Scripture. Now that leads us to the second type of religious tradition, which is a temptation for every one of us. The second type is to do something that is taught in Scripture, but to do it as a rote action, rather than something that comes from our hearts. For example, we're instructed in Scripture to, to worship God together, with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls. Suppose we come to church on Sunday and during worship we're thinking about our plans for the afternoon rather than focusing on God and worshiping Him. Well, we've just engaged in religious tradition which is condemned by Jesus as a sin. Well, we may be even singing the words of the song but our minds and hearts are elsewhere. And we could go through many other examples of falling into tradition. God desires for us to follow Jesus in spirit and truth with all that we have. And so we must submit to Jesus' authority over tradition and eliminate it from our lives. Finally, we need to believe in Jesus' authority over the storm. We're jumping over to Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that day when evening had come, he that is Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. Now Jesus and his disciples were in Capernaum, a Jewish city in Israel. Jesus in the evening, 
told his disciples, we're going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now on the other side was the land of the Gadarenes. It was a Gentile territory where no respectable Jew would go. But Jesus had a mission there, which would involve setting a demonized man free from a legion of demons. In fact, we're going to be talking about that next Sunday in our message, Set Free. But our story today is about the journey and not the destination. The story continues in verse 37. It says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And so Jesus, tired from speaking and ministering to the crowd, lay down in the boat and fell asleep. The disciples, meanwhile, were wide awake, for a violent storm had suddenly materialized, and the waves were so high that they were breaking over the boat and beginning to fill it with water. The disciples shook Jesus awake. They rebuked him. They accused him of not caring that they were all going to drown. Well, in verse 39, it says, And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And so Jesus didn't answer their question whether he cared about them perishing. He simply rebuked the wind as he would a demon, and he spoke to the sea, saying, Peace, be still. And immediately the storm quieted, and the sea calmed, and then Jesus asked them two connected questions. The first was, why are you so afraid? Jesus was saying that disciples should not have been so afraid. Why not? First of all, because they were in the boat with Jesus, who has all authority. And whenever whenever you are with Jesus, you are safe. Secondly, because Jesus had said they were going to the other side. And when Jesus says that you're going to the other side, you're going to make it to the other side, no matter what storm you may encounter in the journey. The second question that Jesus asked was, have you still no faith? In other words, by now, the disciples, their faith should have grown from the actions they'd seen him do in the past. In the first chapters of Mark, the first three chapters, we've already seen Jesus cast a demon out of a man in the synagogue, healing and delivering many others, healing a leper, healing a paralytic, healing a man with a withered hand. Jesus had shown that he was the Son of God by forgiving sins. They should have had faith that even in a storm, Jesus would take them to the other side. You see, fear and faith are mutually exclusive according to Jesus. If you're afraid, you're not in faith. If you have faith, you won't be afraid. What was the disciples' response in verse 41? And they were filled with great fear. And said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So interestingly, the disciples are filled with great fear at what just happened. But this was another kind of fear. The first fear in the midst of the storm was a fear for their very lives. This great fear was the fear of the Lord. An awe-inspiring fear of Jesus, who had the authority to command even the wind and the sea. And so we must believe in Jesus' authority over the storm. Now, we started the message this morning talking about the storm that we are encountering in America Day today. And we have a choice to make. Will we be filled with fear or will we be filled with faith in Jesus' authority? Jesus' words to each one of us this morning are, we're going to the other side. This storm is not going to stop you from fulfilling God's purpose for your life. This storm is not going to stop God's purpose for America. The other side for each of us ultimately is heaven with Jesus when our life's purpose is over. And as long as we stay in the boat with Jesus, we're going to make it to that other side, to the heavenly shores. But whatever you're facing in life today, whatever storm is tempting you to be fearful, just pray and say to Jesus, I'm going to the other side with you. We're going to make it together. And when you do that, Jesus will bring calm and peace to your soul. The storm that seems so threatening will fade away and the presence of Jesus will fill your heart. Believe in Jesus' authority over the storm.
the beginning, we read the verse where Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples. And since Jesus has all authority, he commands us to go to the other side, which is to go and make disciples, to bring more people into the boat with Jesus. Jesus has authority over sin, over sickness, over tradition, over storms and everything else. And so this morning, be encouraged. When you're with Jesus in the boat, you're going to make it through every storm. Invite those around you who are fearful and stressed in the midst of the storm to get into the boat with you and Jesus. And there they'll find peace, joy, and forgiveness. And together, we'll make it to the other side. Now this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to repent, to become a believer, to get in the boat with Jesus. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray with me and to be born again. To do that, you need to admit, A, admit that you've sinned and turn away from that sin, repent. B, believe that Jesus died to forgive you, rose from the dead. Ask him to forgive you and C, commit your life to following him as your Lord and Savior. So let's pray together. Father, today I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. And I repent. I turn away from those things. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that my sins might be forgiven. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I believe you rose from the dead and I commit myself to following you as my Lord and Savior. I want to get in the boat with you for the rest of my life and into eternity. For those who are believers, let's pray as well. Father, we thank you that Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. Forgive us for the times when we forget about Jesus' authority. Forgive us for the times when we succumb to worry and fear. We ask that you build our faith as we put our hope in you. We believe that we are going to the other side of your purpose for our lives. We're going to make it through the storm. We pray for those around us who are not with you, Jesus, in the boat, who don't know you, give us opportunities to tell them about Jesus' authority. Help us to help them to find peace and joy, even in the midst of the storm. We pray that you would help us lead many to Jesus in the next months of storm in our nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you made a commitment to Jesus Christ or would like more information, I'd encourage you to connect with us via the link below this video. We'll pray for you, offer you some helpful materials. You can find out more information on our website, lifechurchstlouis.org. And our Sunday morning services are now open at 10 a.m. at 15036 Clayton Road, Chesterfield. You're invited to attend if you live in the St. Louis area. Online donations to help us reach more people for Jesus are available at lcstl.org slash give. And next Sunday, we're going to continue in our message series, Jesus in Action, from the book of Mark with the message, Set Free. I invite you to join us then. God bless you and have a great week.